really rejuvenating to the spirit and the soul in, in empire, in the heart of empire. And so I was thinking a lot about you and like the work you do, because I, I sometimes, I wonder whether that could thrive in a space like this, that's so overwhelmed with all of these complexities that it makes me sad, but I just, it's the things that I think needs to be elevated here. Those who are healing, you know, recovering, regenerating the planet, um, you know, in a way that kind of complements the defenders, the human rights defenders, and those in the front line fighting. I just feel like the healers need to be in to heal relationships with nature. <laughs> But it's just, yeah, it, it's been so much noise, so much, yeah. So I have been thinking about you, Percy. Well, thank you. I appreciate thoughts for sure. Um, yeah, I agree with you. And I, I've thought about this before because I feel like there are kind of different spaces. You know, you have the activism space and then you have the cultural space, which I feel like is, does involve, you know, the healers and ceremony and things like that, but you don't see them together very often. And I, I, um, I, and I wonder why, you know, I, uh, I did some interviews with these um, older women. Well, it was kind of intergenerational, but they are pushing for changes in our local universities and colleges in San Diego. And it was really interesting to, to hear the conversations of the older women, you know, who are doing the work in the 70s and 80s versus those of us doing it now, because the older women really spoke about that time as being kind of fun and, and like um, humorous and, and a kind of a community space and, you know, like you're fighting, you know, the struggle, but like it was kind of fun <laughs> in a way. Um, and then when you speak to people, you know, like myself, um, it's more like we're just in the fight and we're so tired and, you know, we're constantly just battling and battling. Um, and it's such an, a, an interesting different way of looking at the work. And it kind of just made me think about, yeah, about those, you know, the, the elders who have been doing this, you know, who, who have been in the struggle for a long time. And just, I think with age comes that wisdom of how to take care of yourself and how to take care of others around you. Um, and I kind of, I, I, I do wish our spaces were a little more intergenerational because at least with me, I don't find them to be that way, you know, unless there's some sort of event or something that brings in the older generation. Um, but it is missing and we can't just walk around being angry because that's going to make us sick too. And, um, and I don't think we, we talk enough about, about that. I know, you know, the Western perspective is self-care, self-care, um, but there's this other indigenous way of looking at it. And, um, we have to, we have to have that well-being, yeah. um, in, in the work, you know, uh, which it should, which which is something that we should get from this, right? Because we are we're protecting our mother, and we're um, building relationships, and we're renewing a lot of us, uh, you know, our cultural practices on land and waters, and we I think we should uh, look for that more and just make make sure that that's present too, you know, that we're that we're um, also including that well being and and the elements of that and the the things that bring that up and, and allow us to really be be in that. Mm -hmm. and just hearing hearing you talk I, i've this last week i've also been a little really caught up between drawn a little bit of attention between here and being here in aotearoa um and what i know is happening back home particularly in papua new guinea um and knowing how the daily life needs to go on how people you know how children are growing how people still um need to have food um, for their children to be healthy and mm -hmm. to care for them, you know, and the care that happens when you know there's nobody else coming to help you. You know, you have to watch out for any little nick or anything that happens on your child's body because it could become something else and then you're in another space. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of strength that comes from that. And a lot of people are watching, caring, for people, because they know that's where the buck stops. They're not going to get any help from anywhere else. 
well, that's where it's going to work. And, and then in the New Zealand situation, had this fabulous um, engagement. I'm not sure if I told you about a pr little bit of work that I've been doing, which is reviewing um, um, some fabulous projects. But one of them is on the Wanganui River. And so the Wanganui River is one of those um, natural entities that has been given personhood in Aotearoa. And, but, and so that's great in all sorts of ways. But the group that we were introduced to and we're talking to is a group that's particularly, and it's also the site, and it, just yesterday was the anniversary of this brutal battle that was called Parihaka, where soldiers um, moved into this area and just completely destroyed and raped and decimated this whole area. So the whole area has got a very heavy trauma around it. And so this particular group for the last 10 years has been working on that trauma. And their whole um, approach is around trauma and healing. And they have been funded by mainstream health research funds now. Um, and so that what we were looking at is how we can strengthen that and keep getting funds from it. And one of the things they did this time was that they introduced um, young people who are traumatized, they're traumatized by their the, the trauma of their genealogy, but they're also trauma, traumatized by the realities of unemployment and of drugs and you know continual racism in the country. So they're working with young people and the way in which they did that was to start off with the tuna, which is a fish, an eel in the, in the river. And they say they do everything from the perspective of the tuna. And so there's two key things. One of them is understanding the tuna, understanding this eel. And the other one is understanding what they call the hinaki, which is the, um, which is the, the, the um, kind of this basket that you use to catch eels in a way that, you know, you need to eat eels. People needed to eat eels to survive on the awa. But there was a relationship between how many you taught, you caught. You didn't, you know, just in the same context of how we fish now, we don't, we, we have to have the right amount of space so the small eels can get out and you can get the big ones. And you don't want the big, big ones because those are the rich, the wise elders. So here we had these young people, this young woman and her group who were talking about taking these youngsters who were traumatized from a range of things to see life from the perspective of the tuna. And, and these, this was fabulous. And it was beginning to be intergenerational. But the interesting part, you could see this young woman in particular and her colleague finding a way to articulate what they were doing. And some of the elders were letting them have the space and others weren't. Because, you know, they are talking to us and we were also, we've got money to give them, you know, as a group. I think we're a relatively kind group, but, but the other elder in their wisdom felt that they had to cut short that narrative, that story, which actually, as I'm telling you, you can see the power of it. And this was coming from young people. This was coming from people who have been traumatized. So I was that was really heartening. And as difficult and as heavy as the trauma was that they were dealing with, it was really heartening to see how they had made that connection. So, you know, I think it's those sorts of stories, and I'm sure it's the kind of stories that you will also, and I'm sure it's the stories, Maureen, that you've heard in different spaces, how those stories enliven enough people to um, act cognizant of the particular, what I would say, hinaki, the particular net <laughs> that you're working with, and that it is the, that's the skill. You've got to be able to recognize that framework, which is what you're talking about, Maureen. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a real, I mean, here you see, it's not a tension, but it's like this real, uh, trying to even the balance between science, rational science and indigenous knowledge. So at the moment, you know, the whole climate conference is trying to consider how to incorporate indigenous knowledge systems. Mm -hmm. um, so you see, you know, these kinds of storytelling, they're very particular because they, you know, they, they transfer the kinds of intellectual knowledge that's based on, you know, a hell of a long time 
into a very rigid uh, system, which is science. Mm. So today I was in a, a plenary listening to um, the IPCC um, scientist. So he was quite interesting in the sense that he was working in the Arctic, but they knew they had to incorporate indigenous knowledge because right now science has agreed, agreed that indigenous peoples and territories are in fact the, it's where biodiversity is thriving. It's where, <laughs> you know, we're, we're keeping uh, systems intact, like, you know, our territorial systems are intact in, thanks to indigenous peoples. But the knowledge systems are complex, as you described. You know, it's it's oral. In some cases, you know, it's it's in these kinds of stories. So you can see science is, which is where the Western system places its emphasis. It, it drives this entire negotiation. But now it's negotiations now with indigenous peoples about knowledge system. So tomorrow there's a a dialogue session. It's a closed session with knowledge holders and the secretary, the secretariat itself, really to try to understand the kinds of concerns, exactly as you say. The elders are saying some knowledge is not for you. Mm -hmm. It's not for you to access for, and people want to know for what purpose mm -hmm. you want this access. Um, who intends to use it? How is it being documented? You know, the whole list of that. So it, it, it's really fascinating to watch and observe this negotiation now that will take place tomorrow between the knowledge holders from seven regions and the climate conference itself. But yeah. But Maureen, I think, you know, the UNFCCC, I mean, no, IPCC, there's a lot of space in the IPCC reports that qualify the extent to which their knowledge goes. Um, and so, well, I, I, I mean, some of the documents that I've read, you know, they are quite precise as scientists to sort of stop and say, that's all we can say. We can only say that. You know, and, and I remember that big debate in New Zealand with a colleague of mine here in New Zealand who was a geomorphologist and he had done, he had studied 500 or 300 atolls in the Pacific and had done the measurements that geomorphologists do, do about whether they're sinking or rising and concluded that of those 560, 232 were actually growing. And so that's fine to say that, but the next thing we needed to say is, so which are those 232, 232, and are there people on them? But what he did instead was he sort of said, and so Pacific countries shouldn't worry about sea level rising because 232 are actually growing. And so we could have to go back and say, but hang on, you know, one, you're a geomorphologist, we appreciate that you've done those measurements and we can see that, but we need to know if only two of those that were sinking were populated by the whole of a country. That's significant. He got into a lot of difficulty in New Zealand, as you can imagine, around that, and left the country eventually um, to go to North America. Um, but, you know, I think good science, even in the Western way, will articulate its limits clearly. So and I think, yeah, I think what. What they were sharing, this lead scientist who did the Arctic and um, kind of oceans work said that he, they first had to recognize the limitations and the rigor of the IPCC reports. So he said one of the real limitations is that it has to be published, yep. uh, peer reviewed indigenous knowledge uh, papers. So he said that starts to limit it. So I think very good scientists then try to push the boundaries of uh, yep. trying to include it. So he said his team, they were lucky they were able to work to improve the way the IPCC uh, science reports are being produced yep. to try to really facilitate, you know, oral uh, beyond the academic rigor of published 
Um, so he said, you know, really just trying to improve on that. But he said, there's still massive gaps um, in terms of the incorporation of that in those reports, but they've tried um, as scientists to do that. Yeah. But you can see then, you know, it, it yeah, so I don't know. It's, but... it's like you're saying, you know, so for the indigenous um, knowledge component of IPCC, the best one is the first one. Because yeah. there has been so little since then published in that form. So, you know, the subsequent IPCC reports, while there may have been changes, in, in actual fact, the, the bulk of the work was done in the first two IPCC reports, and you're, they're absolutely right. It's not the framework for capturing what they need to understand in order to advance anything. So it's interesting to see where they go with that. Yeah, and I, I think um, you're bringing up such a good point. You know, you can see my work behind me. So I'm actually doing my literature review on land-based education. Um, so I've just been submersed in all of these things and it's a systematic lit review. So it has to be peer reviewed, empirical. Um, and, and, you know, everything you're saying just speaks to this whole process for me of just trying to find published research um, when we know that so many of our communities are doing this land-based education, um, you know, to, I mean, mainly for us, right, for cultural resurgence and um, sovereignty and these different things. And I think, um, you know, my focus was education, but I came across other articles. And one of the ones that I, that I saw was, um, it was scientists from the university working with a community um, to collect all this information. And what they did is they had, you know, their scientific readings of water and temperatures and all these different things. And then they had the community members who are harvesters um, create these maps and then these oral histories of these grounds where they would harvest. And, you know, these folks, I mean, they learned from their parents, right? Who learned from their parents. And so it's, you know, multiple generations talking about these um, places, you know, and the importance of place and the stories. Um, and I thought it was just such an interesting way of doing this work that everyone has said needs to happen. You know, there's, you know, so many pieces on the importance of indigenous knowledge and, you know, TEK, um, but I don't think they found a good system. And I think, you know, even when I was looking at papers, the big thing that was lacking was really uh, coming to this work from an indigenous epistemology. You know, it's like they want to have this Western way of doing everything, but then throw in, you know, uh, indigenous um, harvesters or whatever. And I think what I really appreciated about this research was that they really went to the community and the community said, well, um, we need to map our territories because the government is saying this is, you know, our boundaries of how we, you know, uh, of land use. And we're saying, no, it's actually a lot larger. Um, so they were able to, you know, kind of make this argument with scientific data and all of these things that really bolstered the First Nations argument. Um, but, but also, you know, when you look at this, it's so many years of relationship building, right? And they have to sit there and they have to listen to all the stories <laughs> from these 49 harvesters. You know, it's not just a real quick, like fill out this form. Yeah. Um, so much more. And I think until the Western world can approach um, the relationship with land and the relationship with people, um, right? They're never going to reach that gold standard of how these uh, knowledges can really work together and create something better. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of what I worry about, you know, is just them wanting to put in the effort because you know, I, I mean, for any of us in dominant society, I don't see a lot of effort. Um, but, but you know, as this um, study really showed, they were able to just gather so much information that is beneficial to everybody involved. Uh, you know, and the community came up with the idea of what they what they wanted um, this this program to look like and these efforts to look like, and it ended up being really good. You know, these these folks trusted the community to say, this is what we need. And they, they trusted that, that it would be good research. And it was in the end. And I think, you know, until that power dynamic is, is equal and, and the Western scientists and these organizations are, you know, ready to say, we value it this much instead of like, yeah, we value it to throw it in here. And, you know, um, what, you know, what, what's going to happen? Cause you know, we have to have a change. People have to, look at these relationships differently and that does take time 
and, and effort um, in areas that are really uncomfortable for the Western world, like building relationships <laughs> with people and actually listening to people. Um, but there's, you know, there's so much promise and it, it, you'll have to let me know, Maureen, or let us know how, how it goes tomorrow. I would love to hear what those conversations kind of sound like. I mean, it was interesting, the scientist who did the Arctic work, because he said that was one of the biggest challenge mm -hmm. is that the timelines were too short. Yeah. And he said, it, it's ridiculous. He said the only way that they were able to salvage as much as they could was based on a relationship with one person. Yeah. So that one person facilitated the network and the conversations and the engagement with communities that he said they would never have, but he recognized it. And he said, it's, it's, the, it's the challenge that they have with the IPCC systems of reporting that it doesn't consider the length of relationships, the trust you have to build to really appreciate the, the knowledge that indigenous people have to bring it in. And he said, he, he was very open about what limitations they had. But one of the things that I really noticed from the knowledge holders, they were sitting, the elders were sitting in the plenary, but most just listen. And I think it's really good, like they don't, react too quickly. Obviously, I think that's just comes with the wisdom, you know. Um, so they just listened mm -hmm. to, you know, the report and the feedback from the technical experts. So, you know, there was another woman who sat um, on a funding mechanism. And, you know, she was talking about the experiences of how long it's taken them to set up an indigenous dedicated funding mechanism. So it took 10 years for them to negotiate. Mm -hmm. You know, but it, it comes down, she said the key thing was that she had an indigenous person on her team and that made a hell of a difference mm -hmm. to how this, these things uh, kind of incorporated into this kinds of mainstream stuff. Mm -hmm. So there was this kind of experiences that they were talking through today. But tomorrow's session, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated to see, but I've seen how the Indigenous Caucus has been very careful. It's not a recorded session. Um, it's a closed meeting. Um, and they are very clear that this exchange between the knowledge holders yeah. and you know, scientists, technical mm. people, is carefully managed because they, they keep saying that at the heart of these exchanges, there's still no trust because the power dynamics, because we recognize consistently, the power dynamics is unequal in terms of whose knowledge is of more value than the other. So I think it, it's still negotiated, which is really good to see the indigenous caucus negotiate. They negotiate space, access, and they're very careful about our knowledge. Yeah. So, you know, I, for, to some degree, I'm quite keen to see mm. how they carefully manage it, but there's some really smart mm. cookies here mm. um, who are just holding firm that, you know, we're just not going to give you open access yeah. <laughs> to our knowledge. And, yeah. You know, and I think I think a couple of things. One, one of them, Percy, I was going to say, I'm not sure if you know the journal Alternative. Yes, 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 yes. And so there's a lot that they have been working to try and publish in there around exactly what you were talking about. But coming back to what you're saying, Maureen, about that quietness that that is there, that kind of real, that it's quiet because I always get comfort with that in the sense of there's a knowledge there, not only, as you were saying, that the very careful negotiation, the understanding of the power dynamics of many of these people who've been in these spaces, but but also it also exudes a little bit of confidence that they are in touch with understandings of how things, and not in any, not in a in any magical sense, but but in an understanding that there is something that is 
of comfort to them as well. And it might be what we call epistemic comfort. It might be that they, they are they're happy, they're, they're comfortable in a way of seeing the world in which this little engagement is a mere irritation. <laughs> that, you know, there's a lot of other things happening in the world and, they, um, and, and, and that gives comfort. Yeah, I, I have to say that it really, you really feel the wisdom in it. And, and like I said, you know, there's so much white noise at the moment. Yeah. There's just so much noise yeah. um, and distractions, you know? And so I was in a space yesterday where we're talking about financing. Yeah. And obviously the moment you start talking about billions of dollars, yeah. you see, you start to see things really unravel pretty quickly. So, um, and indigenous, I have to say, is now very sexy. Mm -hmm. yeah. In a way that is, you know, it, it kind of is a real, for me, it's kind of like, they have to be really cautious because everybody wants indigenous now. Everybody is like, you know, now you see nature-based solution, indigenous nature-based solution you see it qualified it's indigenous is qualifying yeah. everything in this conference mm. but it's partly to do with recognition so yesterday i was a little bit upset with the conversation about money because i just find money is um mm. it can drive conversations down to mechanisms and access mm. and mm -hmm. very quickly so then I wanted to just pick up on something Percy was saying, but about value. So I said, my only one intervention I made yesterday is that, and it's that wisdom. I said, if indigenous people understand the agency, we don't come to the table because we don't understand this agency. Our agency comes because we understand the value of what we bring. It's not money. I said, the moment we look at it from a dollar sign, I said, it's a game over. I said, now the world is finally, finally acknowledging that it's indigenous peoples, their knowledge systems, their ways of knowing, their, their real integrity in managing territories that's going to save the world. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's what we bring to the table to negotiate. It's a values-based system not money yeah. so and and really for indigenous people because we kept saying they kept saying well, we need a dedicated fund i'm like yes perhaps but if we don't talk about money just yet because i said we need to learn to walk out yeah. i said right now our value is more we they yeah. need us more than <laughs> we yeah. need them yeah. Because we can save ourselves and our people. Yeah. I said, everything that indigenous people do is contributing to global goods. I said, what communities are doing in Papua New Guinea in terms of forest management, managing? I said, those are contributing to global goods. That's what we bring. The billion dollars is nothing compared to what we bring to the table to negotiate. And it's a value system. So then it's really trying to re-collaborate the, the discussions around financing, because for me, financing is very, mm. yeah. it can be very divisive as a mm. tool. Mm. And you see it immediately, because it's like, who, how, how much do we access? How do we access it? And I'm like, no. Mm. By the time it reaches communities, it's what, 20,000 USD? Mm -hmm. No, the value of what people bring is more than that. And that and that's a really important point, Maureen, because that takes us back to the discussions around the imperatives for addressing climate change. It was never about the loss of money or the loss of, you know, it was never about that. It was always an imperative around the moral responsibility of everyone to look after what they're doing. And of course, those people who have a, um, have been responsible for more needed to feel that moral responsibility, but they never did. Instead, 
they took it away from those principles and those morals and those ethics of care and cast it in terms of representation and, you know, and financing and mechanisms and technical solutions. And I think that's where we've come adrift, you know, in the very early days of that climate change discussions, you know, there was an understanding of morals and ethics. And I think that though sits within um, um, the indigenous caucus. It might also sit within the feminist courses, but any of those values based caucuses, I'm not sure about conservation. I'm not sure about, you know, because they have been, you know, they are a very, very broad church <laughs> um, in that conservation area. And, you know, I, I, you have a better sense of them, but I think in the, in the women's caucus and in the indigenous caucus, there still is a recognition, rec recognition that they are values based and they will argue on those values or well, not argue. They will, they hold, they are able to hold their ground because of those values. Yeah, Not and, uh, but the conservation groups, the environment groups are a little bit different, but the conservation groups are the biggest beneficiaries of the climate financing mechanisms. You know, they're well set up, they can absorb funds. So, you know, some of the conservation groups are presenting that, you know, we, we can be intermediaries, you know, to hold funds and disperse yeah. funds because we have the reputation. Uh, we know that we have the know-how. Um, yeah, and, and the Indigenous Caucus leadership just kept calling it out. So, <laughs> Good for them. Yeah. 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 But it's messy. It's still messy. So. Mm. And so what are you speaking on tomorrow, your tomorrow? So interestingly enough, I'm going to be speaking on ocean kinship. Oh, nice. In fact, they want, they, it's really a panel on rights of nature. Yep. There you go. Yep. Um, but they just asked me to speak on oceans because unfortunately oceans is missing. How can that be? it's but you mentioned 30 30 by 30 i mean that's a big issue in ocean debates isn't it yeah but not under the climate uh call oh. mm, interesting the oceans i think in the climate unf triple c is only mentioned once wow i think article four or something mm -hmm. um but for pacific it, for us if we don't land oceans yeah. you know uh, oh. mitigation adaptation loss and damage everything that's in climate if we don't land oceans we're in trouble mm -hmm. um, but we are not because the politics of oceans is mm -hmm. it's really the kind of you know the, the space the geography where it's no man's land. Yeah. It's kind of like free for all. Yeah. Do whatever you want in the and yeah, so I'm mainly here on oceans. Mm. It's tough. That's so interesting. I was listening to NPR this morning, um, our national public radio, and they had someone on and he studies um coral reefs, and he was talking about how what great buffers they are right to um, storm surge and all of these things and how you know I mean they're predicting 90 percent destruction by 2040 um, but it was so interesting because I've actually been thinking about oceans and water um, a lot lately so you know I, I, I mean I think just that conversation in general isn't where it should be you know I mean I'm sure oceans water more generally um, bodies of water but it, it just astounds me that that wouldn't be a part of the conversation when we we're seeing all of, you know, this um, coastline degradation. And um, yeah, that's just, that's crazy. I would think that there would be, let alone the islands, right? And the people on the islands and all of, you know, what's going on. And that is just so, uh, so typical Western, I think, right? That they're like, well, there's land and there's oceans and those things are separate. And uh, the oceans only give us 
something. We don't live in the oceans. Um, well, they don't live in the oceans. <laughs> well, uh, and it's so typical. Yeah, and, and so we there was a conversation yesterday about how to bring climate change, oceans, and biodiversity. Because the way the governance system, the multilateral governance systems is that they sit with different bodies. And it's, it's where, you know, they, they keep coming back to these indigenous systems because of the way you can't separate artificially <laughs> any of these things, right? I mean, we know that, but it's so, you know, the, you listen to these panels and such brilliant people, but we are siloed. We are so siloed in our thinking. And so for me, for I think indigenous peoples, we struggle because we, we have to adapt to the way the system is constructed around governance. So, you know, these artificial constructs are very clearly not working today. I mean, it's a ridiculous thing. If you, how can you talk about climate mm -hmm. when you don't talk about oceans? I mean, oceans actually perform a higher climate function in terms of absorbing carbon, yeah. storing carbon, um, the kind of systems of the oceans which keeps the polar system. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's like a living system that keeps the planet alive. Yeah. But it, it's not considered within the climate cop. But Maureen, this is where your notion of oceans as kin is really important because um, the boundaries of kin are not predetermined. We don't know who our kin is going to be. We do know who our kin are and we are constantly learning who they are because there are always little surprises about who our kin might be. Um, and so that allows for that. That's kind of a more fluid kind of epistemological framework that we can work within, um, which doesn't work in, a, in, in that kind of the demarcation of land mm -hmm. that um, climate negotiators work within, the states. It's the conference of the parties. Most of those punt parties are nation states. Not all of them, but most of them are nation states. So, um, you know, it's interesting to see some of the other parties that come in there, the other value one, the one that I'm particularly interested in is the role of the Holy See, because that kind of has, a, especially for the Pacific, that also is another kind of way. But I think, you know, ocean is kin is fabulous, fabulous kind of intervention, because it's a little bit also like that proverb that's well known around the region, which is about, you know, Kamui, uh, you know, Kam Kamua Kamuri, walking backwards into the future. Um, mm. You know, so, yeah, we do know who our kin have been, mostly. Um, but I'm reminded because the, we had to negotiate the word kin. So, um, you know, one of our elders was saying, look, I'm not comfortable with you look, talking about kin. Mm -hmm. And when I said, why? And she said, because there's some things that must remain sacred mm -hmm. so that it holds power, mm -hmm. like mana. And she said, you know, the moment you start saying all these things, it starts to lose its power. So then we said, what's a better word that you can live with? Because she said, this is, you're talking about relationships, one. She says, it's relationships between people, okay, across oceans, so, you know. But she said, it's relationships with the, the creatures in the ocean, too. Yep. And then she said, it's relationship with spirits, yep. which is contained in that. And she said, it's the spiritual dimensions that I would prefer that we don't speak about. Yeah. Because they are, they hold power to us and our understanding. So she was very cautious about it. So we said, so, okay, so what do we say? She said, guardianship. Talk about it more generically and broadly, but it is about our role. So she said, but she said, because the spiritual elements are very particular. And then I'm reminded, I 
I sent my stuff to PNG to try to document the story of the Bismarck Sea. Mm -hmm. Why the chiefs, the elders were saying it will never take place. Deep sea mining will never take place. And because I heard a story, and the story is that the, it's like the Bermuda Triangle. So it's a pathway between our spirit world and the natural world. So it's a, it's a gateway. Mm. So in the words of the elders, they're saying you can't desecrate that mm. because the spirits will respond. Mm. Um, but it's a powerful story. So when we went two or three times to the community to ask for this particular story to be recorded, and on the third occasion, the chief um, sent the women down to my staff, who's, who's male, Joey, and said, you need to come to the man house. Mm -hmm. But you need to prepare to come into the, to the house because we have to almost initiate you into the process of storytelling, mm -hmm. which is sacred. Mm -hmm. And then you have to decide whether you will document it or not. Yeah. So the women prepared him for the story. But before that, he saw these um, uh, oh, stingrays, mm -hmm. entire school of stingrays emerge mm -hmm. and were just like, the kids were playing with it on the, the shoreline. They just almost like beached on the shoreline. And he said he just got goosebumps because he just knew this is this is a dimension that this is this is different. This is not <laughs> this is just not ordinary. Anyway, they initiated him. And the chief was very kind because he said to him, My son, you must be careful about what you ask. Because what you ask, we can tell you, but there are consequences yep. of documenting. So they were, but they are very insistent that these stories hold power yep. and that they are very convinced that the desecration of these sites will not take place. Yep. But to document it in the form, which was film, would be to take away its power. Yeah. So then he came out and he said to me, we can't do it. Yeah. We have to leave the magic yeah. in the stories and in the rituals and in these processes because I've seen the stingrays come up. Our ancestors come up and say, we're here. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it, so she reminded me that there are some things that we cannot speak about openly and and that reminds me of I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard of that um the hind Mar, the hind marsh bridge and woman in australia and and that was a similar story where um developers were going into this area in hind marsh they wanted to build this bridge and the aboriginal woman there and this is well documented said no you can't it's women's knowledge to and, and, and they, they said, we're not going to tell you it. We're not going to share it for exactly the same reasons. Ten years later, they had developed the relationship and um, the woman gave the developers an envelope and they said, inside this envelope is that knowledge. There's only one thing we ask, that you don't open the envelope. And they didn't. And they moved the construction. But it took 10 years of that kind of debate to develop that trust for those women to give that and to make that one demand, knowing that they wouldn't open it. And so it's possible, even in a place like Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, so that's quite a well-documented kind of, you know, um, case in the power of indigenous knowledge in the most ridiculous country. <laughs> you know? Well, maybe the second most. Fascinating. So, 
So do you all ever, um, you know, I think there's this resurgence happening, um, but then I also see how, uh, at least here in the, the United States, um, there's also this element of people wanting that indigeneity, you know, and unfortunately there's people in our communities who will give it to, to folks. You know, I, I uh, my husband and I always joke because there's people who, you know, make a living being Indian. Um, so do you, I mean, do you all ever worry, you know, that as, um, I mean, as these things, like you said, become sexy and have a value that some people do want to put, you know, money on, um, that will lose some of that, that that, you know, capitalist mindset um, will kind of win, especially in communities where we do have, you know, the poverty and the struggles and, and all of those things. I mean, it came up yesterday um, in one of the sessions, I mean, the financing session. And I think the real concern around commodification of culture, indigenous knowledge. So I think there's, there's a lot of, there's still good people aware, but I think there's quite a lot of concern that the disconnect with the next generation we might see more of that come through. So I think there's, there's a lot of emphasis now on how do we take young people along um, who really can get it and get the politics and really understand that, you know, money is okay, but it can change and shift. And so, you know, even now I'm lucky. So one of the really good things that's happened to me here in Glasgow, is that my flatmate is a 70 year old woman from Peru. Oh. And she's, she's phenomenal because she's exactly what you were saying, Percy, she, she considers herself a pioneer. Mm. But, you know, these are the generations that paved the way for indigenous to be where it is today. Mm. So it's their struggle. So she sits in the back and she listens to everything going. And then I asked her, her her views about what really scares her when she's in spaces like that. And it, this is exactly her thing is that she's, she said, you know, they fought so hard for our generation. So we are the next one to come in. But she said there, there are some concerns is that we are professional. Mm. Many of us are professional indigenous. Mm -hmm. She says, yes, we got you all very intellectual, very smart. You really can speak the language, you know, how to maneuver. But she says, what worries her is that we forget some of it because we get too good at it. And then when I asked her about the next generation, it's where she said, it's our biggest weakness is that we are not transferring them enough to take them along because the gaps are quite big. So then she, you know, she, she, was, she gives me her observations every day. And so she, she tells me what she sees and she sees that exactly that, the description of our own people taking advantage of indigeneity at this precise point. And she says, you can see it. And so when I ask her how, she says, you see it. It's, they wear the indigeneity yeah. on the outside, yeah. what she says to me. So she says, when you listen, it's when you know that these are just occupying and taking advantage of a space. Mm. So, you know, there are people who can read, can see, um, but People are concerned that with this new global attention on indigenous mm. that we start losing because you know money is coming in, opportunities to travel. Mm. Uh, I mean, you know, they were showing me stuff with um, certain geographies. And, you know, it's so well resourced to the point where you know they buy your clothes. Yeah because it's winter, so you, you see the investment. Um, 
<laughs> and it, it, it's so organized and managed that you do worry sometimes about, you know. Yeah. And while you might want to offer your children and next generations and the next ones to, and, you know, to, you, you want to offer them the chance to be involved in these global debates. It's a real trade-off because, um, yes, people want to listen to bright, young, well-badged people about climate change. It, interestingly, especially from the global south, they need to be badged. If you're not from the global south, you don't have to have any signs of where you're from. Um, but it's becoming increasingly difficult for new generations to go back home, to go back to where their ancestors are, to hear those stories. And that's what I worry a lot about is, um, you know, Percy, that's why your work then is so important as well, because you're providing that pathway for new generations to learn and, and to be in touch, even though you may think it's a, a you know, there's this what I heard you last time saying that many of your um, many of your older wise people are a bit shy of um, speaking what they know and what they don't know, you know. But there's still that connection, and you know I do worry about ensuring new generations have an opportunity to not only be performing in that big place, but to also have the opportunity, as I was saying in the in the in this river in New Zealand to to hold a tuna, to go fishing, and to understand what fishing is really important. It's a livelihood, but it's a relationship as well. So, so that's where we need to have our creatives and our artists, you know, who can transfer all of that wisdom in a way that is picked up and experienced differently. Because the reality is a lot of new generations are not gonna have that experience. And not going to learn from that embodied connection with place. I, I, that's my biggest fear, and that's where I look to the creatives. <laughs> that's where I look to stories, Maureen, and yours, Percy. Yeah, I think I think you make such a, a good point, and I think um, you know what I see in my community too is just uh, our cultural knowledge has become power too, for some of us, you know, and I think, you know, when you speak with the, you know, um, when you speak with the elders, they're really quick to just to say, well, this is how my family did it. This is, you know, how I was taught mm -hmm. uh, because there is that, right? There's that diversity of doing the same way that we see now in contemporary society. And uh, what I see in my, in, in my, uh, well, in the whole state of Nevada with all of our tribes is really kind of this fighting of the younger people when they learn something of saying, no, this is how you do it. No, this is how you say it. No, you know, and, and I, I kind of used to see that with the elders before we had a family reunion 10 years ago and we tried to play Shoshone bingo and they were fighting over how to say like rabbit. And we ended up having to end the game because of the elders. <laughs> um, but now I'm seeing it in the younger people, you know, and my cousins who, who are just uh, really kind of, you know, ha taking this knowledge and just using it, you know, sort of for their benefit. Um, and I think that's what worries me too, just about, you know, Western education becoming like the highest um, honor, even within our communities, you know, we celebrate our college graduates yes. so highly, you know, but then I, you know, there's so many folks I see where I'm like, well, they should have a party because they don't use and they're the first in generations, you know? Um, and I just kind of worry about that because, you know, I see it myself that I, you know, when I'm, when I'm in that environment, I just become <laughs> like that environment. And it's when I go home, when they say, like, why are you using that word? Or why are you, you know, thinking that way or acting that way or whatever? Um, and I just, you know, I just, I just worry about, uh, about that, you know, a little bit where people are hesitant to share the knowledge because, they're going to hear that it was wrong or they shouldn't, you know, be doing it or, um, or whatever that is. And I know, you know, communities are all different in how they do this. Um, but within my own community, I kind of see that and worry about it. And especially, you know, reading all of this stuff about land-based education, the benefits, um, you know, like that's who we are. That's our identity. That's our, our first relationship, our first teacher, uh, all, you know, all of that. And, 
um, if we don't have that, you know, that transference of knowledge in the environment, like you said, you know, through doing and, and in the correct context, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what it will look like in 40 years, you know, and I, I hope we, you know, I hope we still have the diversity that we have now of, of each family, you know, doing things a little bit differently or, um, you know, folks from each area. But I think that's such a pressing concern, along with the language, you know, because uh, it all comes together. And sometimes we're so focused on language that we don't think about, like you said, fishing or, you know, these, these other parts of who we are, too. Yeah, I mean, I had a young, one of my students, who, a very serious young man who um, sat through my course, which was on innovation and sustainability, and it began, it begins with a quote from the Cook Islands about sustainability being defined, I think I've told you this, about the magic of buoyancy. Um, and he was very thoughtful through class, and he came, and he actually asked that question, he said, I keep asking my uncles and aunties and grandparents about, you know, please tell me, I want to learn. And they keep on saying, not yet, son, <laughs> you know, not yet, son. And I felt his frustration. Um, and he said, what can I do while I'm waiting? Mm. And, um, and it was about take a look around you. You know, so, you know, so he's waiting and he's prepared to wait. He's very patient. Um, and, and, it, and, and so, you know, you know, I don't know, but he was really looking for some kind of guidance, you know, and as a teacher, you think you've got to provide some something, but, you know, he, he did say that. He said, what do I do while I'm waiting? You know, and, and, it, and, and it's like, we all wait, you know, and we all have to find things to do while we wait. And so the best way of doing that is to have a look around you, in front of you, you know, what's just in front of you. And um, yeah, it was an interesting discussion. I mean, I, I, I met, I mean, the complexities of indigenous knowledge. So I met this amazing, um, he's, he's a traditional voyager from the Marshall Islands. So this is a really tiny community, but he's, he sort of revived the art of canoeing, you know, all of that. So we were having a chat and I said to him, so, how do you do it? So we're talking about the fact that the stick maps of Marshalls is being disputed by, you know, modern scientists, et cetera, et cetera. He said to me, yeah, Maureen, you know, he said, look, you have to understand something. He said, look, so I said, how did you revive the skill? So then he said to me, okay, I'll honestly tell you this, but please just, just know that this is, this is just really the way we have to understand indigenous knowledge system. So he said, so when I was little with all my cousins and brothers, the elders would take us out and they, they would take us to different parts of the, the lagoon. So sometimes within the lagoon and sometimes in open ocean. So he said, they would teach us how to read the elements by throwing us overboard and saying to us, can you feel land? And he said, you know, you, he said, for a while we lied. We said, yes, yes, we can feel land. <laughs> because he said, we didn't even know what they were trying to teach us. And he said, when you're in the water for a couple of hours, trying to understand this, this, this real immersion with nature. He says, you just lie because you're little, you're tired, you're hungry. You wanna get back in the canoe and get home. So he said, he said, what he didn't realize was that each time they lied, the elders knew they were lying. But he said, the training got difficult because he says, what they do is that they then take you out in a dark night, no moon and they throw you overboard. And then they say, swim to that land because you should by now feel land in ocean. So he said, you eventually learn 
by, by really immersion in nature. You really learn where it's landward side. And he says, there, there's so many things to learn and that that's the complexities of indigenous knowledge. Right. So then, he said, so then we learned to feel land. And then I said, how about stars? And he said, he said, there was one advice the elders gave him. He said, in the end, you, you will get the constellations. You will eventually get the constellations and read it. He said, but there was one trick that the elders taught them. And it was about dead stars. He says, you need to be able to identify what's a dead star that's really bright in the sky, but it's dead. He says, because if you don't recall its position of the dead star, he says, you will follow it and you will end up in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> because and he says, and then you will realize it's a dead star. And then you start all over again and you record the dead star in constellation. Mm -hmm. But his, his real thing to me was this. He said, Maureen, our ancestors learned to approximate. They learned by making the mistakes, recording dead stars. They learned all of these things and then they incorporated. So he says, so of course, modern science looks at it with their GPS and they are so accurate. He said, I can tell you without doubt, he said they knew they could spot land. I mean, this is less than one meter high in the darkest of night, because he said, we learned to read so many different elements and that's the body of knowledge. So he said, he said to me, it, it is so complex, but for the way to teach it and transfer, it's by making mistakes. And that was the other key thing is that you have to make so many mistakes and lie because <laughs> of just, basic hunger to get home and cold. But he said, now, he said, now he understands, you know, what it means to feel, how to recognize if you are in open ocean versus within a lagoon system, and you combine it with everything else that you're taught into one body of knowledge. So they knew where fresh water is. So he says he knows journeys. He says, if you look at the way um, the islands are settled, he said, it's also following water, mm. fresh water. Mm. So he says, you know, there are water sips on the bottom of the ocean. There are, it, it's everywhere in the marshals. So he says, when people talk about, you know, having no access to fresh water, actually there is lots of fresh water. Mm. It's just dispersed in the ocean. Mm. But that's the body of knowledge. And the transferal is kind of, you have to learn it and make all the mistakes mm -hmm. and laugh about it. Yeah. <laughs> it becomes a story, right? <laughs> it becomes a story. <laughs> that's so interesting. I was speaking with um, my great uncle um, and he was talking about, you know, our reservation is very isolated. We're in the middle of the state. In Nevada, you know, that's, I mean, people talk about Nevada as being, um, you know, the no man's land. It all looks the same, very, very deserty. But we have a lot of freshwater springs in all of the mountains. So he said that when he was young, he remembers the, the routes they all traveled was from spring to spring to spring is how they got anywhere. Um, which didn't make sense, I guess, to, to the settlers, right, to do it that way, but really actually makes a whole lot of sense. But, um, but it was so interesting because it really had me thinking about, you know, when the settlers came, well, first of all, how long it took to find every spring in the state and to know at which times maybe it wasn't running or was running. Mm -hmm. um, and when the settlers came, you know, they never, like, they never based anything on the springs which is like the life force water. Uh, and they created all their own roads that have nothing to do with, right? With like the really important essential thing 
um, which is just so fascinating to me. And I just, it's just so hard for me sometimes to understand that point of view, the Western point of view, because it just makes no sense. It's so nonsensical in so many ways. Um, and, but still, you know, like you said, it, the power of that system is up here, even though it's like, just kind of a dumb, <laughs> right? Just this dumb system. Uh, and especially when you're talking about, about it in relation to land, right? You know, it's like, um, you know, the, the settlers coming and starving to death because there's no food when there's like food, you know, all around them. Uh, choosing to eat each other right in, in our mountains because you know they got trapped in snow instead of uh, like finding food which was there the whole time mm -hmm. um, but it's just such you know such that perspective and I think you know when you're talking about that interaction with our indigenous um, knowledge you know that example you gave about him knowing all of his indigenous knowledge is about navigation. And then, so think, you know, you take all of that knowledge and then you combine it with Western knowledge and it becomes like this amazing, right? It's like two knowledge systems and you can just take the best and create something totally different and, and new and better, um, which seems so obvious, right? But still, right, you're, you're, you're speaking with these people and there's still like just such a clash over what is valid, what, you know, should be taught in schools and what shouldn't. And uh, it's just, just so fascinating because there's so much wrong with the Western way of viewing the world, right? Not just the information, but just the whole way of orienting yourself <laughs> and, and others. Yeah, he made me laugh because he was like, okay, honestly, I'm not here because, you know, I was just gifted. I just made many mistakes. I lied a lot. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it's really fascinating, this whole debate discussions about access to this knowledge. Yeah. Um, and I think the Western science has still not been able to grapple with the nuance and complex ways that indigenous peoples read, you know, the stars, and the yeah. you know, the wind, and the ocean, and land, everything. They, they still can't grapple because of the siloed way they're taught and formed. Mm. Yeah, so they're grappling here with, with the, the nexus between whole systems that we've just... just <laughs> Is your um, contribution tomorrow going to be recorded, Maureen, or is that closed? That's a closed session. Mm, no, the ocean one is open. It's very short. Um, yeah, but I, I think I'm going to just lean a little bit on maybe the arts side of it too. Who who else is speaking on that in that space? Mostly lawyers. I think there's lawyers. There's a or maybe a conservation person on it. I have to look at the list. Mm. Yeah. One of the bits of work I've been doing recently or thinking about a lot lately, and in the context of this concept in the Pacific, which is this kind of time space, the Tava, you know, the space, which is the VAR. But I actually, what I've been thinking a lot about and have done some writing is actually we don't talk about time as much. And we don't talk about time because science tells us that climate change is on a geological time frame that is really hard to match with human understandings of time. And my argument really is that, hang on a minute, <laughs> I know people who understand time that's and not in the religious spiritual sense but who understand time in many more diverse dimensions than you're even asking us to and so i i'm really keen to see people bring that concept those that, that more broad that more you know kind of that that wider understanding of time and the relatedness the, the concept of pace and how we do that. And, um, and also recently talking about, you know, we're trying to get a kind of an image for a particular project we're working on. And one of my 
um, poet, my friend who's a poet, she she came up with this idea that of, of a stone um, and for this is to name a Pacific thing and who thinking around it was, you know, stones are constructed through tension. They're shaped by water and wind and the space. And within our Pacific region, there are so many different kinds of stones and rocks that countries are built on, but travel as well. And we can carry them and they settle in spaces and some places are more welcoming of different sorts of stones and they become part of the place as well. And, um, and so they hold within them sort of quite a lot. And, and a lot of people didn't like that kind of understanding of the stone as being that, but, but the way in which the story she told around it was a really, was a great metaphorical way of understanding movement, consolidation, solid, solidity, fluidity. Um, and also that, that problematic of time that is not problematic for us. We understand stones. But geologists would tell us that, you know, you know, that's on another dimension. You guys don't understand all that, like that, that geographical time, that geological time. So I'm really keen to hear how we, we bring that dimension of time um, into our debates as well. And it's something that I see out in you know, our older people. Again, we're talking about time. You become old in a particular frame. <laughs> you know, you, the concept of pace, all of that, I think that's an under, you know, it's underdone and it's dominated by Western understandings of time, urgency against geological time, you know. I met this, I mean, there was, there was, a, I don't know whether you know her, but she's a oceanographer, legendary oceanographer by the name of Dr. Sylvia I want to say Earl, mm -hmm. but she was speaking last night about oceans. And for me, I was just like, whoa, she, she's coming from a Pacific worldview because she was talking about time. Mm -hmm. And she was, she was talking about stones. And she mm -hmm. said, you know, people just look at these things. And she's one of the very first women who kind of went deep, deep mm -hmm. into but her referencing around oceans was very, I felt like she was very indigenous in her worldview, but she's a straight up scientist. scientist. But her yeah. language was not a language of science in a way. I mean, the way she talked about time, so she did time, and she referenced time in very interesting ways. So I'll, if, if I get the recording, I'll circulate it. I'd love to. I was like, whoa, she is the ocean envoy. Because, you know, I've heard right. many Pacific Islanders, but she really, and value, she talked about value. She was talking about this, this thing as a living entity. She was just like, mm -hmm. but she was totally smashing Western notions of the ocean which is vast, empty space, yep. which we can only understand <laughs> one dimension, which is the surface. Yep. And she just took it all the way down to rocks. And she talked about rocks in time and space. And I was just like, who is this woman who gets it? Who gets it? And who speaks it in such a way that was, I was like, wow, she is, mm. yeah, she's quiet special and she was so dismissive of the current constructs of understanding and human failures. She was just like, we're such a stupid species. <laughs> um, but she just, she just kept presenting it as this thing. And she talked about time and rocks. And so she just reminded me. <laughs> she was yeah, someone who kind of made me feel she restored a little bit of my faith in humanity yesterday. <laughs> Good. Yeah. That's funny you say that humans are stupid. I was um, reading a, a paper um, and it was about an Anishinaabe land education um, project, but um, it's, it's just right on the, on the border of 
uh, like the, the Great Lakes. Um, so it's in Canada, but the tribe is, you know, crosses both. But they were saying how um, all their stories talk about um, how humans are like the dumbest, right? We're the newest. All the other animals were here before us, right? All of the lands, the rocks, everything was here before us. Um, so we're the newest and so we're kind of the dumbest, right? So we need to learn from everything around us because we really have no idea what we're doing. Uh, which I think is just such a great way of looking at humans because I, right, it's like the dumbest species. Um, and it's, it's like, we're so clueless. Well, the Western way is so clueless of really seeing what we have done and what we continue to do. And it's so, you know, I was listening, I've been listening to these daily podcasts. Um, I guess we're like on day three. Are we on day three of the gathering? So, so they're just quick, you know, recap 14 minutes. But it's so funny because it's like they're applauding these things which are so basic, you know, like deforestation. Um, so basic, like it's the biggest thing. And they were interviewing somebody who was indigenous. I want to say maybe Indonesia, this woman. Um, but it was funny because she was saying, you know, we've heard all of this before. Like to have, you know, to applaud these newest commitments and all of these things, you know, we've heard it before. And I'm sure you all, I'm not, I haven't really been in the sphere of, of, of the climate crisis. Um, so I'm learning so much from the two of you. So um, I, I just, I'm, I'm kind of curious what, how you all see the future, right? Um, the next gathering, uh, where do you see, kind of where do you see it? And, and what do you see the role of indigenous people? Cause I'm sure you've seen, you know, the caucus change over time. And like you said, now we're sexy. I'm sure we weren't always sexy. Uh, so, so where do you kind of see, See the role of indigenous people within within this specific space of COP26? Well, I mean, th what I did say was that we really, really have to come in fully armed with the knowledge of our value. Because I, I think that if we don't come with that, um, we will start to fragment way and quite quickly. And you can see it. Um, and we've got to be willing to walk out. Yeah. That's my point. My point is we've engaged this, this system for so long. So, you know, when you hear the struggle to establish to get recognition, to then get equal rights, to get the safeguards into language, um, I think my view is that we've got to figure out when to walk out because I think that's going to be critical for, for engagement purposes, because it's, it's like to be taken really seriously, I think we've got to figure out when to walk out. And that includes, you know, the feminists also, because, you know, we, we fought so long for engagement and we get it. And then we fight for, recognition and then we get it mm -hmm. but every matter data science is saying that everything is wrong mm -hmm. we are destroying species at rates that are unimaginable the climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions are still exponentially rising mm -hmm. um, the violations the human rights you know, everything is escalating. There's no peak and drop. So my view is that the next time we've got to seriously start thinking very strategically of when to pull because it's critical. So, you know, everyone here is saying we are in, you know, all the Pacific Islanders say we, we talk about existential crisis, but we're still engaging. So my view is it's time that we get smart because we understand our value. And we would have more productive things is, which is to regenerate, um, heal, repair all the damage done. That would be where most of our productive work should go yeah. rather than this. So I could say we have to learn when to walk out be critical mm. you know enough of this thing about you know exactly as she said you know everyone's applauding deforestation by 2030 <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I mean, really, seriously? And then you hear the technical, technocratic solutions to fix it. Oh, yeah. so yeah, that's my view. But I think there's a, there's a gap, um, which is what I wanted to talk to Anasui about. I think we need, I think this space is a really good one that I think we should land in the chaos that's called this. Because I think there's a space for it that's still not being occupied in this way. Um, but that's my view. I, I, I just feel like we've got to figure out when to exit. We've engaged in good faith. Yep. Okay. All of that, it's not translating. No. And it's certainly not quick enough for the kind of work we have to do and the kind of work our communities are already doing. Yeah. So, but that's just me and I think I'm still minority. <laughs> <laughs> but I think and you're absolutely right, but walking out is not um, a single thing. Walking out means you've prepared your back well because you will receive many barbs as you walk out. So walking out is about having prepared your back well and having somewhere to go. Um, so walking out is not just a sole act of uh, position. It's an active approach to changing direction. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I mean, look, it's, I'm a novice in this space, so really, what do I know? <laughs> Don't listen to me, Percy. I'm just like. <laughs> so I, think, I think what you bring into this space, Maureen, is, as I said, I know there's a lot of technical people who can, who need to get around those kind of documents. And many of those people have got a broader picture to work with them. Many, many, many more don't. And the kind of... Um, the technocratic way in which these kinds of negotiations grind on will continue. It's a machine, it's already, it's a huge vessel. And to stop that vessel or to redesign it or to change its direction while it's currently moving um, is not, does not need to be our responsibility. But somebody has to decommission that vessel <laughs> and it shouldn't be us. Also, you know, we, um, yeah, so, so I'm really clear that that's not going to go away in a hurry. But it is making sure that um, it's not going to ride over our, our places and our times. And so having some steerage is really important. Some control over where that vessel goes is important. So yes, you can have everybody working on the multiple decks, doing all the wordsmithing on each one of the kind of paragraphs, but actually we do need to have leadership at the top. And one of the things I would really like to have would be to see some good indigenous knowledge holder, I don't know, someone from the global south feminist, you know, at the top as well. And I don't know if anybody's appearing in that space so that we get high level, top level, great leadership mm. i don't know i mean I, you know they they they've been framing a lot of the conversations around reimagining things but we're still reimagining within <laughs> the same frameworks you know and and it's because we are so structured and formed into reimagining with these frameworks. And that was my view is that you have to step out to reimagine. Or the reimagination comes from somewhere else that doesn't sit within the constraints of this, because this is very constrained. It, it, it's formed, it has a structure, it, it has a language, it has very particular that you have to kind of master, which is all okay. But I was like, the reimagining doesn't take place here. It has to be outside. And we already know where the outside is and where that's happening. It, it's really back in our communities. And that's where I think we need to 
that's the front line that we defend now more than ever. Mm. Um, so it's almost like returning back to the front lines to our people to maintain the integrity of all of our systems. Mm. You know, like to, to really help explain why, you know, I, and, you know, Gary Jufa brought this up. He said, look, our people need to feed themselves. So they will cut those trees down mm -hmm. because the, it's the only thing that they understand. Mm -hmm. They said, you know, it's all very good for us here to be talking about deforestation. But he said, but for my people, it's very basic. Mm -hmm. So he says, if anything, we need to be going back to shore up our communities so that they hold the integrity of territories. Because he says, that's, we know that's why, that's where the defensive line is at. Yep. Yep. But we still have to provide for our people at this stage. So in some ways, I feel like that's where the productive energy needs to go for a lot of us is to really go back to the front lines mm. whilst others battle on here. Because for me, the biggest role that we have now is just really maintaining integrity of territories. That's it. We can't lose anymore. And we certainly can't. Yeah, we need to be moving into the, like healing, recovery, rejuvenating territories now. And stopping the kinds of exploitive expansionist agenda would be where I think productive energies need to go. To save the planet, really, ultimately. Um, but it's disproportionate again, because it means it's our people again mm. who have to do this mm. and salvage a, a, a system that really doesn't, and that's what I said yesterday. It's mm. the fact that people don't recognize the value of what our communities are doing as a global good. Every day. Every single day. Every single day. So. So, Maureen, I'm just aware of the time and whether you need to take a break. I need to take a break. Get my coffee. Yeah. But really fabulous. Sorry, I'm just, you know, I just feel like I'm in that, in that little cusp of um, losing focus with us. Um, so wish, so grateful to have this chance just to kind of talk and hear hear you talk and hear you too, Percy. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about Percy too because you know it it really has been reminding me. Um, but you you can see it all here. It, it's kind of like the performance theater that Anasuya is talking about. Everything is so performative that you kind of worry a little bit about it. But yeah, I'm really grateful for this space. I really made sure I came here today because I still don't know what I will say tomorrow. I'm still looking for words. Yeah. So. Maureen, please. I'm really sure you will find those. But send me your, the, the, the paper on the river because that's quite a critical one. And maybe I'll have a look and think about it. Which one? The one about the, the net. The net, the hinaki, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And thank you, this has been such a blessing. I don't know how I ended up part of this project. Um, <laughs> I'm just so thankful that I did. And I'm just so appreciative of sharing this space with you and everything that you all shared with me. Uh, it's just been an honor and a blessing to spend this time with both of you.